Hello, and welcome to the video accompaniment to chapter one, section one of our text. In this video, we'll discuss statements and open sentences. If you haven't already, be sure to read this section in the text before continuing in the video, as I'll assume that you're already familiar with the definitions and terminology from the section. In particular, in this video, we're gonna classify some sentences and determine their truth values if we can, We'll give an example of an open sentence and discuss the details of it. And finally, we'll determine which values make an open sentence true, and we'll look at a few examples of that. All right, let's get started. After reading the section, you should know that statements and open sentences are really at the core of logic. They're sort of the building blocks of logic. And so it's important that you be able to pick out statements and open sentences and distinguish them from other sentences and from each other. So I think a very useful exercise is to just go through several sentences and classify uh, what kind of sentence it is, figure out what kind of sentence it is. So let's take a look at some sentences. What is the capital of Georgia? Well, in this sentence, something is being asked, a uh, question is being asked, and so this is an interrogative sentence. So I'll just go ahead and write an R here for interrogative. So I'll use the, to uh, stand for interrogative. Atlanta is the capital of Georgia. In this sentence, something is being asserted, right? I'm saying this city, Atlanta, is the capital city of Georgia. Something's being asserted, so this is declarative. And when you're dealing with a declarative sentence, then you can classify if it's a statement or not. And so in order to do that, we need to determine if this thing is true or false, or just figure out that it has it's either true or false, but not both. Um, so in this case, Atlanta is the capital of Georgia. Uh, that's a true statement. So this is a statement and it's true. Detroit is the capital of Mich Michigan. So a similar statement, um, only this time I'm saying Detroit is the capital of the state Michigan. In this case, it's still, something is still being asserted and this is either true or false and not both. So this is a statement, and in this case, it's a false statement. Detroit is not the capital of Michigan. He is a famous actor. So again, something is being asserted, saying this person, he, is a famous actor. Uh, but notice that this, uh, we can't say if it's true or false because we don't know who he is. So in this case, this uh, is not a statement. It's an open sentence that depends on this variable, he. So this is declarative, open sentence. And so we can't say if it's true or false. Um, only when we specify who he is, uh, do we get a statement that is either true or false and not both. So it depends on that uh, variable. Something like, wow, pretty clearly this is an exclamatory. Remember, uh, exclamatory means we're expressing some emotion. I'll make that clear by just drawing an exclamation point. Go to the store and buy more toilet paper. So we've seen every kind of sentence uh, you can have, right? We had an interrogative, we had declarative sentences, and we have exclamatory. The last one is imperative, and that's what this is. This is a command to go do something. And so we can't say if it's true or false. Notice we can only assign true or false values to statements. All right, so in these examples, um, we're looking at sort of what you might hear every day, uh, sentences you might just hear while talking. Um, however, in this class, we're gonna encounter a lot of uh, mathematical sentences and statements. Um, and so in this case, notation is used, which really just stands for words. Um, and even just an equation is really, uh, it's a kind of sentence. So let's take a look at uh, some examples of that. In this first example, you can see what I mean about notation. I haven't written any words here. Nevertheless, this is a sentence, right? Read it out loud. One plus five quantity squared is equal to 36. So this notation really stands for some words which make up a sentence. And so it should be considered a sentence in its own right. Um, in this case, let's classify that. Something is being asserted, right? Anytime there's a equation, um, this means something is being asserted. I'm saying the left expression is equal to the right expression. So this is certainly declarative. 
And we can figure out if it's true or false by just evaluating the left side here. 1 plus 5 is 6. Square that, you get 36. And it's true that 36 is equal to 36. So this is uh, a statement, and it's true. True statement. Estimate square root of 2 to the nearest thousandth. Um, so what kind of sentence is this? Notice that uh, I'm not asserting anything here, but rather giving a command. And so this is imperative, telling you to do something. So we can't say if it's true or false. It just doesn't make sense. In this example, we have x squared minus 5 equals 0, so similar to the, the first example here. But this uh, depends on the variable x. And so while this is a declarative sentence, while this is a declarative sentence, it depends on this variable x. And so this is an open sentence. Remember, I can plug in values for x, and what I get out is a statement, something that's either true or false. Integer a is even. So again, this is declarative, and it's an open sentence, because it depends on this value, this variable a. Notice in this example, a domain is given. Remember, a domain of an open sentence is just those allowable inputs, similar to the domain of a function. So the domain here is the integers. In the previous open sentence, a domain wasn't given, and so that was ambiguous. Um, so a good form is to give a domain, um, but sometimes it's clear from context. Integer 3 is even. So notice that I got this sentence by plugging in 3 for a in the last sentence. So I took an open sentence and I evaluated it at a particular um, value for its variable. I plugged 3 in for a. And what I get out is, well, let's see. This is something being asserted for sure. It's declarative. And the integer 3 is even. Is 3 even? No, it's odd. Um, and so this is definitely a statement, but it's a false statement. So I could plug a lot of things in for A, and anything I plug in for A, I get a statement like example 11 here um, that is either true or false. Lastly, we might encounter some more, um, we'll sort of build our way up uh, to more technical uh, statements like this one. For any positive integer n greater than 2, the equation a to the n plus b to the n equals c to the n has no non-trivial integer solutions. So even though this has some variables floating around in it, uh, we'll get to this later, uh, but this open sentence has been quantified. Do you see this, this bit, for any positive integer n? Uh, what's being said here is that no matter what positive integer n you give me, this thing is going to be true. So it doesn't really depend on n. I'm making a statement about uh, that the open sentence is true for all of these values. So this is actually a statement. Certainly something's being declared. It's actually a statement, and this is true. We now know that this is true. For a long time, this was a conjecture, um, but now it's known that this is true. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, sentence later. For this next one, we'll take a look at an example of an open sentence. Remember the notation that's used for declaring statements and open sentences, right? If I want to declare a statement, I, write, I might write something like P um, 3 is even, right? I use this colon and then the letter uh, that's going to stand for uh, that statement. And you might see things like P1, P2, uh, maybe P2 is um, 3 is Um, greater than 4. Something like that. So in this example, uh, we're given this open sentence. Remember, when an open sentence is declared, um, you should indicate what the variables are in the open sentence. So here, uh, the open sentence Q of AD is being declared. And Q of AB, that symbol is going to stand for 3A plus 5B is even. And here we're specifying the domain. A and B are integers. So that's what I'm considering uh, for my input here. 
Now, like I said before, an open sentence can be evaluated to get a statement. So for example, Q of, let's think, Q of one, three. So I'm evaluating the open sentence. I get a statement. This would be um, three times one. So three plus five times three, that's 15 plus 15 is even. I get that statement. And we can look at that. Three plus 15 is 18. And this is a true statement. Uh, but I could plug in something like Q of two, four. Um, actually, I want to do something like Q of two. Let's do Q of two. Negative one. Negative one is an integer. So I can evaluate the open sentence there and get, okay, so three times two is six minus minus five is even. Six minus five is one, uh, which is not even. And so this statement would be false. So that's the big takeaway here uh, is that really these open sentences act a lot like functions. I can plug things into them. Uh, instead of getting a number out with a function, uh, you get a statement out. And that statement can either be true or false. Now, one thing that's going to be really useful to do, and we'll want to do a lot in mathematics, is to figure out for which values an open sentence is true. So we'll do that in the next slide. We'll look at uh, several examples of open sentences and figure out all the different values that make them true. In this slide, we'll work through um, determining what values of, of input make a particular open sentence true. So we'll look at a few examples of this. So in each case below, we're going to be given an open sentence um, where n is going to be a positive integer. We want to know what makes each open sentence true. So the first open sentence, p1 of n, absolute value of n plus 2 equals 0. So remember, we can plug things in for n, like 5, uh, but that would not make this true, right? 5 plus 2 is 7, absolute value of 7 is not 0. And so that would be false for this. So I just want to find those n that make this true. Um, and so we need to do a little thinking here. How do I make an absolute value 0? Well, if you remember, an absolute value is like a distance to 0, right? An absolute value of negative 3 is 3. Negative uh, absolute value of positive three is also three. It's the distance of that number to zero. So I want, if I want the distance of n plus two to zero to be zero, like I do here, I would need n to be negative two. However, n um, is supposed to just be a positive integer, right? We're given our domain up here, n must be a positive integer. And so there are no positive integers that make this true. And so I can say here, no such values. <laughs> Second example here, P2 of n, n squared minus 9 is less than or equal to 0. All right, we just want to know those positive integers that make this true. Well, one thing that we can do here to help us um, is to factor this n squared minus n, or minus 9. So n squared minus 9 is the same thing as n minus 3, n plus 3. And so I know that equals 0 when n is 3 or n is negative 3. And then we got to think, when is this thing going to be less than or equal to 0? Um, so if you remember some techniques from calculus, you might be able to do this. Now we'll talk through a solution. Um, so n minus 3 and n plus 3, uh, those are my zeros. So it sort of breaks up the real line into three regions to the left of negative 3, between negative 3 and 3, and greater than 3. So we just need to see where is this thing positive uh, and where is it negative along that real line. Um, so we got to think here. If n is less than negative 3, this will be negative. Uh, and this will be negative, and so I'll get a positive value out. Uh, if n is bigger than 3, n minus 3 will be uh, bigger than bigger than 1, uh, greater than or equal to 1. n plus 3 will also be positive, um, and so this will be positive. And so uh, just if n is between negative 3 and 3, so if n is 0, uh, negative 3 times 3 will be negative. So anything between 3 and negative 3 makes this less than or equal to 0. 
So the answer here, I would put down, um, I'll say true when n greater than or equal to negative 3 and n less than or equal to 3. So, so long as n satisfies this condition here, p2 of n will be true. Take a look at p3 of n. Again, we have some uh, polynomial of n equal to 0. And so again, I'd like to factor this. This time we want to know when is it equal to 0. Um, so n squared minus n minus 6. Uh, we can factor that. We get n minus 3 and n plus 2. And so when is this thing equal to 0? Uh, well, this is equal to 0 when n is 3 and when n is negative 2. But remember, we're just considering positive integers. Uh, and so this one would be true when n equals 3. So that's the only positive integer that makes this true. All right, one more example. n plus 1 over n is less than or equal to 2. Um, Okay, so this one you might have to think about a little bit. Uh, we can plug some things in here, some positive integers in here. P of 1, 1 plus 1 over 1, so that's 2. That's less than or equal to 2. So P of 1 is true. We can say that is true. Does anything else make it true? So P of 2, 2 plus 1 half, uh, that's bigger than 2. Uh, what about, so P of 2 would be false. Uh, P4 of 3, 3 plus 1 third, um, yeah, that's also not bigger, uh, or that's also not less than or equal to 2, so that's not true. It turns out as n increases, right, n plus 1 over n will always be bigger than 2, so long as, as n is at least 2. And so wait, we can say that P4 of n is true when n equals 1. So uh, in all these examples, we might get a particular value of n that makes uh, that makes the open census true. There might only be, we would say there's a unique value that makes it true, uh, as in these last two examples, or we might get a set of values, and we'll talk about sets in the next chapter. Uh, but here we have some collection of values that make it true with p2 of n. And in p1 of n, it might be the case that there are no values that make it true. So that's um, that can happen, and we'll want to pay attention to that. All right, that's it for this video.